Father, we thank you again this morning for your presence with us among your people. Thank you that you're our Father, that we're your children. You've begotten us again unto a lively hope by Jesus' resurrection from the dead. You've begotten us again by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of your creatures unto you. We pray, Father, that the Holy Spirit will continue to work in our life and that we will be worthy, we will be worthy, accounted worthy of this work that you have done in us. We ask this morning in the time of study that you've given to us and the messages that you have for us that you continue to open our eyes to the truth. We rejoice in your truth and your word in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> well, if you'll open your Bibles over to uh, the book of Romans, of course, first of all this morning. Last week we dealt a little with Romans 16. We're going to deal with it a little more this morning. And then probably uh, next Sunday we will deal with it a little more again. <coughs> We're going to deal with it a little bit at a time until we're through with it. Romans 16, 7, salute Andronicus and Junia, <clears throat> my kinsmen and my fellow prisoners who are of note among the apostles who are also in Christ before me. Now we see here in this verse that Paul in his salutation to these uh, two people, Andronicus and Junia, uh, commends him in four regards or in four respects. He has four things to say about them as identification. And although there are some other greetings and salutations here, such as the one given to Priscilla and Aquila, that actually take up more space, that is in the number of verses, they take up more space, really the fullest salutation when you count the individual parts of it, the specific parts that make up the whole, uh, the, the largest, the fullest, most complete one is the one in verse 7 to Andronicus and Junia. Now, I'm saying to you this morning, I'm glad for that because of the fact that a lot has been made of this verse, uh, verse 7 here of Romans 16, a lot has been made of this verse by the so-called biblical feminists. Really, you can't be both. That's a contradiction of terms, but that's what they use, biblical versus non-biblical. The non-biblical ones would be just the secular ones out there in the world who are after uh, equal pay for equal time. But the women in the church are after uh, equal pulpit opportunities and responsibilities for those who are equal after all. Males and females, they're no such thing anymore. They're just it's, I guess, Galatians 3.28. So I'm glad that since they are using this passage, the egalitarians, that we don't just have one little statement or so that you can kind of twist. We've got a whole full verse here. It's got four different parts to it. Besides the names, you've got four different parts to it. Now, one we've already dealt with, fellow prisoners. So that leaves us then with three. My kinsmen, who are of note among the apostles and who were in Christ before me. So we've gone from four to three. But we go back up to four in number whenever we say that the first thing that has to be discussed is simply this name, Junia. Now, a large part of the tussle and tumble, the confusion over this passage here would be solved if we could just be certain about this name. Who this name refers to? That is, what gender? Is it Junia, a woman, or is it Junius, a male? And you've got to remember that as we work our way through this, and in the process you're going to be hearing others' views that I mentioned, uh, people are trying to solve the name situation with their theology already working in the background. Or to say something else in addition to that, they try to solve the name situation while they already have working in the background their kind of concluding or conclusive thoughts about other things found right here in this verse. Let me show you what I mean by that. Whenever you go down to this third phrase, who are of note among the apostles? And let's say that you are a person who, on the basis of the other teachings in Scripture, do not believe that a woman could be an apostle. So your mind is already made up about that phrase, that, that it could not be calling Junia an apostle. All right, since you already have that understanding, then whenever you go back and try to work on the name, watch what happens. That type of belief is going to already be working itself into 
how you understand the name. And so here are your options. If you already have the belief that a woman cannot be an apostle, and you, you don't think that's what this uh, third phrase is saying, then you've got to go back and say, well, Andronicus and Junia must be two men. Uh, that way, well, let me, let me rephrase what I just said. If you do believe that third phrase is saying that they are notable apostles, well, Junia can't be Junia then. Junia would have to be Junius. You're going to have to make the name a masculine name if you believe it's referring to apostles later in this verse. If you don't believe it's referring to apostles, then really you don't have a big problem on your hands because you could just leave it Junia, and all it says is that the apostles took note of her along with Andronicus, whoever he was. Or another position, if you do believe that it says there are apostles and yet you want to try to stay what, what you think is faithful to uh, really what should be the word here, and that's junia, then you say, well, maybe it was a husband and a wife, and when it calls them notable apostles, it's really not calling her an apostle, it's just calling him that, but since she's married, then there's some type of, she's kind of with him, and blah, 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 so forth. So you could say apostles plural and not mean it in a literal technical sense. Now, if you're on the other side of the issue and you're an egalitarian, then you already believe that it calls her an apostle, or you wouldn't be even turning to the verse. That's just a given. You already believe that. And so, you're going to have to make the name feminine. I'm just trying to show you that it's really difficult to separate the issues here and say, let's pretend like we don't know anything about anything and just discuss the name Junia. Is it Junia or Juniette? Or let's pretend like we don't know anything else about the beginning of the, na of the verse, who Paul is saluting, and let's just go down here to this third phrase, who are known among the apostles. Now, does that say that they are noteworthy in the eyes of the apostles or that, that they are apostles, whoever the days are, and notable ones at that? Whenever you say, well, let me just peek up here now, and let's just, oh, it's a woman up there. Well, they couldn't be notable apostles then because a woman can't be one. You see, no one's really approaching the passage from a neutral point of view. You already are working your theology into your understanding of what's going on here. Now, the King James Bible translation, as you note, gives it in the feminine form, and we'll comment more about that here in a moment. Some other translations, commentaries, especially older commentaries, and uh, I guess that's to be understood in light of modern times and the modern theology that you find now, uh, give it as masculine, Andronicus and Junia, because they feel that the verse names two individuals who are apostles. You see, if you believe that the verse names two people who are apostles, and yet you are not of the egalitarian biblical feminist approach, then what, what else can you do? But you've got to go back and deal with the name then and say somehow Junia really means or really is Junius. Others, like the King James Version, just... Uh, keep it feminine. Uh, let me read to you what in one small excerpt in an article a person has to say who is definitely, there's no question about it, is definitely coming from the egalitarian point of view. And uh, this is an, under a section entitled Women in the Early Church and he's been giving uh, various scriptures that he thinks would prove that women can perform some type of ministry in the church that we would think that women cannot perform. All right, so with that in mind, he writes, the Apostle Paul was surrounded by women co-workers. Uh, now, he's going to jump into some passages here, but notice how he starts off. The Apostle Paul was surrounded by women co-workers. Well, what do you mean by co-workers? I think Jesus was surrounded by women co-workers, but I don't find any of them preaching the gospel, though. I don't even find any of them healing the sick or raising the dead or casting out demons. Uh, Mary Magdalene had some demons cast out of her. I don't find any of them doing any of that. I find the men, the apostles, doing that, and I find that he sent 70 out, and those are 70 men that he sent out two by two in 35 companies, but women are with him, co-workers, co well, they're doing some other type of work besides the work that he's doing. In Romans 16, notice right away, I'll take you over to Romans chapter 16. It would appear that 10 of the 29 persons mentioned are women. Now, I don't know how, Paul, how he can start off saying that the Apostle Paul is surrounded by women co-workers 
and then he uses Romans 16, and a lot of this is just greetings to some women, doesn't necessarily call them co-workers. One of them just says, greet Mirus and his sister. So you already, you know, are, are, because you've already said it's co-workers, and now you're saying, now turn to Romans 16, and 10 out of the 29 names are women, then already we've got it in our mind that what you mean by that is then those 10 women were co-workers of the Apostle Paul. Now you might could twist some things and make some of them co-workers in the wrong sense, and you might could not twist some things and make some of them co-workers just in the right sense, like Phoebe carried a letter for the Apostle Paul, but at least some, like Nero's sister, is not called a co-worker at all. Well, anyway, there is some question. Now listen to this. Here's what I want to get to. There is some question whether Junia in 16.7 should be rendered Junia. This particular understanding, that is the Junius reading, this particular understanding has arisen very late end of the 13th century and appears a desperate effort to avoid saying that a woman was among the apostles. See, obviously he's in favor of it being Junia because he's in favor of a woman being an apostle, because he's in favor of the ordination of women today. People don't just have theories that don't have some practical outworking to them. He's in favor of women being ordained in the Presbyterian church today. And so if you are at least a conservative in name, and you've got to find some biblical background or some biblical backing for that. So he said this attempt to turn the name Junia into Junius is a desperate attempt to avoid saying that a woman was among the apostles. Well, of course, he doesn't have the quote exactly right. He doesn't say she was among them. It says that she was of note among them. So you kind of quoted that part of the verse that said what you wanted to say, and you didn't quote the whole thing. She's among the apostles. Even that wouldn't tell us she's an apostle. Couldn't you be among a person among the horses and not be a horse? You could be out there among them, right, not be one of them. But most people don't think of that. They just think among, that makes her one of them. Well, that's not true, but even if it were, you just quoted part of the verse, you left off the other part. It says, who are of note among them. Junia was a very common name. Junius does not seem to have any established precedent. Well, I think I might have a way that I haven't seen anywhere else of really making matters rather certain about the, the issues that need to be certain here in Romans chapter 16, 7. So here we go. Let's start into this. We're going to be discussing the name here, first of all. Salute Andronicus. Now, Andronicus is definitely a masculine name. It is attested not only here in the Bible, but in first century A.D. writings. And it has the meaning, a man of victory. Salute the man of victory. Most names had some type of meaning behind them. Salute Andronicus. It means a man of victory. And Junia. Well, now here's where we're going to run into a little bit of a problem. Now, we're going to have to discuss some of the Greek here, so let's get going on this. Here's what you're going to have whenever you uh, open up your Greek Bible and find what's written. I-O-U-N-I-A-N. We just leave it like that without any marks in the word. So it's really non-pronounceable if you don't know where the accent is. But Iunion, um, let's say. It's pronounced like that. Or you could say, Iunion, putting the accent on the last or the next to the last syllable. I O U N I A N. Iunion. Well, now that's what you'll find in the Greek, and so what is that? I've told you before that, that Greek, like other languages, like Hebrew and, you know, your other, mo unlike English, by the way, that's why it may be a little difficult for you, some of you anyway, to fully understand this, but a lot of your modern languages and ancient ones had your words divided up into three different categories, either masculine, feminine, or neuter. And we don't do that in English. Bread, grass, sky, sun, they're just, they're just words. We don't say that's a neuter word or it's a masculine word or it's a feminine word. It's just a word. And if it's uh, the grass that belongs to a woman or the grass that belongs to a man, endings don't change on the word grass. Grass is just grass. The only way you're going to change it is if you pluralize it. And you're talking about grass is. In Greek, however, words like ship and grass and sun and moon and dirt and rock and they're not just words. They're either masculine or feminine or neuter. 
And you know them by the endings that are upon them. And then you have to memorize that, and then you find out how you decline, let's talk about nouns for a moment, how you decline that noun. Well, these two names, Andronicus and Neon, Junia, or Junius, both of the names are in the accusative. The accusative case in Greek is the case of those words which serve as the direct object to the verb, and certainly these names serve as direct object to Paul's salutation to them. Now, we have direct and indirect objects and subjects and objects and so forth in English, so you ought to understand this much. Salute, that's the verb. Andronicus and Juniot, they are the recipients of the action of the verb, so they are the direct object of the verb. And if that's true, then Greek has a certain case for that called accusative, the accusative case. So you say, all right, now we've got it into the right case, which is what I have up here, in neon. It's in the accusative case. So which is it, masculine or feminine? You know what? That's all you need to know. That's all you need to know, and you can prove whether or not this is a woman or a man. It's not like some mystical, hidden uh, thing that takes special insight or you guess at it or whatever. If we, if, if we could tell from this word, and generally you can't, if it's a masculine word or a feminine word, that's all you need. And you can prove it doesn't matter what anybody else says, this right here is a woman. Now, you don't have to make her an apostle because of other things the verse says, but this is a woman. Or the converse, the re reverse, this is a man. Regrettably, however, the accusative endings for masculine and feminine words here are the same. And that is an on, the a-n. They are the same. Now, that's not unusual in Greek. You find that a lot of times. Take, for instance, the declension of the definite article the, ha, he, ta, tu, te, tu, to, te, to, ton, te, ta. You go from nominative all the way through down to accusative case, and you couldn't hear all of that. But uh, what, I guess in genitive and dative, then the masculine and neuter endings are the same. Ha, he, ta, tu, te, tu, to, te, to, ton, te, ta. And you go over into the plural form of the definite article, and you'll find the same thing to be true there. In other words, what I'm saying is sometimes you can't tell just from the ending because the endings are the same. There it's not masculine and feminine. There it's masculine and neuter that happen at the same endings. You would know from the endings. So... How would you know? Well, you have to go back to vocabulary. How did you memorize the word in its nominative case? How did you memorize it there? Then you'll know, are we talking about a neuter, are we talking about a masculine, or are we talking about a feminine word? So that's really the key to the first key in the first step of trying to understand, is this a male or a female? The accusative case won't tell you anything. It'll tell you it's one or the other, but the endings are the same. Are you all understanding what I'm saying? Basically, if you don't, basically, someone shook their head like this. All right, that's the way you shake it, yes and no at the same time. That means I lost, I, I didn't get all the technicality, but I think I understand what's going on. That, well, I tried to tell you this last time that it's not exactly the same always, but we can have names that we name people here, you know, our children, that either have a feminine spelling or masculine. Take the word fiancé. One of those is pronounced differently. They're spelled the same, fiancé and fiancé. One, the male says this about his prospective bride. The other, the bride says this about her prospective husband. It's the same word. They're pronounced differently, fiancé and fiancé. You didn't know that? Yeah. So the pronunciation changes a little bit. Oftentimes the spelling, you see, will change in the word. Now, here in Greek, it will do this, and it's due to this right here at the end. It's the ending on the word. All the rest of this is, you know, part of the root word itself. So, we turn to the end, and most words in Greek, well, there are a whole lot of exceptions, but most of the time, you can just look at the end and say, that's a masculine word. It's got, a, it's got an O-S ending on it. It's a masculine word. It has an A ending on it. That's a feminine word. And notice, it almost comes right across in English this way for us. Junia, an A. Well, that would be a feminine word. Junius, A-S, that'd be a masculine word then. Real easy. You just turn to the end of the word and look and see what it says. The problem is masculine and feminine words have the same ending here in this case. So, you say, well, what can we do about it then? How can you find out? All right, you've got to be a sleuth, a detective. And here's how you do that. You've got to say, well, that's the accusative. 
I've got to find out what the nominative spelling is. All right, that goes back. You've got different cases, nominative, genitive, dative, accusative, and way down here, vocative. You never talk about that. So let's go back to nominative. That, that, that's like, that's the first thing. That's the subject of the sentence, the nominative. Uh, let's say that Julia salutes Paul. All right, Paul then is a direct object of the verb salute. He would be, therefore, in the accusative case, Junia in the nominative case, because she's the subject of the sentence. You know what subjects are in English sentences. So if we find out what the nominative spelling is, we've got it then. So how can we do that? All right, let me give you several different ways. <laughs> you go about trying to figure out, well, now what was the nominative spelling? Then I'll know whether or not it's a male or female. First of all, there are about three different ways you can try to determine this. First of all, you can attempt to determine it by what we call accentuation. Just accent, if you want the smaller word. Look for the accent. Accentuation. I just told you with fiancé and fiancé. The accent changes whether you're talking about a girl or a boy. Fiancé, fiancé. The same is true here with this word, union. Accentuation. Now, I'll probably need to write it a couple of times here. Let's change some things, erase all of this extra material. Let's write it a couple of times. Now, we don't, we don't know how to pronounce the word because we don't have any accent marks because well, whenever you have the accent marks, then you not only know how to pronounce it, but you're going to know something else. By the accentuation, you're going to know whether or not we're talking about a masculine or a feminine person, that is, a male or a female. Uh, maybe I need to write it a third time to explain something else. So what do we have? One, two, me, on, two, three, four different syllables. In Greek, the accent on the word has to come on one of the last three syllables. It can either come on the last syllable, which is called the ultima, the next to last syllable called the penult, or the next to next to last syllable called the antepenult. Anything earlier than that is not in the running for accents in the Greek language. This would be an ultima, this would be a penult, this would be an antepenult. You've got three different accents. One called acute, one called circumflex, one called grave. Acute can fall on any of, the, any of the possible viable syllables in the word for the accent mark. That is the ultima, the penult, or the antepenult. The circumflex can only fall on one of the last two. A grave accent can only fall on the last syllable in a word. Now, I had to explain that about syllables. Now, let's go up here and look, then, at what we have. If, if this word... If this word is a masculine word, therefore it refers to junius, then it would be eunion with a circumflex accent on the last syllable. Eunion. You raise your voice to accentuate the last syllable. Eunion. If it is feminine, it has an acute accent, an acute accent on the penult syllable, which is the next to last. It would look like that. Eunion. Eunion, eunion. This would be a woman. This would be a man. You say, well, yeah, that's, a, that's pretty neat there because even though, we, even though the A-N won't tell us anything because accusative endings for masculine and feminine words are the same, now accentuation. That will, be, that will be the clue that solves the mystery here. The accent's here, last syllable, the ultima. It's a circumflex accent. It's a man. If it's here at the bottom, the penult, next to last syllable, then we know we're talking about a woman. So say, well, that's real easy. Now we've got the answer. Well, the only problem is the biblical manuscripts in Hebrew and Greek are practically void of any punctuation. No periods, no commas, no colons, no semicolons, and certainly no accent marks. Do you, as you read the newspaper and you look at names like today will be a nice day, see accent marks over all those words? No. Why? You speak English. Today. You don't say today. You don't say remember, remember, remember. You know where to use no because you, 
So the Greeks didn't say, now let's put accent marks over all this because they spoke Greek. The Hebrews spoke Hebrew. You don't have to accent your, you don't have to do that for foreigners, for ignoramuses who don't know anything. So the early manuscripts are punctuation less, practically speaking. You don't have commas, you don't have anything, so you don't have any ex accent marks. Ah, well, we gave you a clue that would have solved it all and we took it away. If we had accent marks in the early manuscripts, then I think that would solve the matter for us once and for all. We would know whether or not we're talking about a man or a woman, but we don't. Of course, in the Greek Bibles, the Greek printed texts that you have today, you certainly do have accents, but these were added later in textual history, and they, they don't carry um, with them uh, the inspiration of God. They don't carry infallibility or inerrancy with them. It is interesting, however, that uh, in the Greek New Testaments today, the leading editions, one being Nestle, of course, and the other being the United Bible Societies, UBS's third corrected edition, they accentuate this word as eunion. If you heard the pronunciation, that's masculine, eunion. Now, I'm not saying I'm going to agree with that. I'm just saying that's the way that the accepted standard Greek um, printed texts do today. Both Nestle and the UBS, United Bible Societies, printed Greek New Testaments accentuate this word as eunion. Therefore, it's Andronicus and Junius, two men who were either noteworthy in the eyes of the apostles or who were notable apostles. All right, so there's one way you could attempt to determine conclusively and if we had enough evidence, it would be conclusive. But here's one way you could attempt to determine conclusively whether or not we're talking about male or female by accentuation. However, as we've just shown you, the early manuscripts don't have accent marks, so we don't know. All right, here's a second way. Second way you could try to get back to the nominative spelling of the word. And that is let the context determine. Let the context determine whether we're talking about a man or a woman. That could help determine gender. You say, well, how could the context? Well, listen, if it says that eunion, however you want to put the accent right now, just pronounce it with no accent, uh, gave birth to a baby, well, I think the context would tell us we're talking about a woman. Even if we thought it, well, even if it called her Jimmy or Mike or Butch or Rocky, if they gave birth to a baby, that's not a man or a boy, that's a girl, right? It doesn't matter what the name is. The context would tell us that, that, that the person behind that name, maybe that's a nickname that they got or something, but the person behind that name is a woman. Or if it says such and such, the name, we don't know whether it's masculine or feminine, became king and sired 84 sons. You know, that's, I don't care what the name, it might be Julie or Mary, or, but that's a man behind that name, though. He became king and sired X number of sons. So the context could help us determine now, what if it said there was nothing else in the verse, there wasn't Andronicus, and there wasn't this phrase, who are of note among the apostles. It just said, and send my greetings to Junia, that apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, the context would tell me right away, it couldn't be a woman, because women can't be apostles. Now, that, that's what people don't like. They're saying, well, you're reading something into the text. Well, the Bible's going to be consistent with itself. And God never tells us, now just isolate a passage and forget everything else I've ever told to you as my people. He is, he is a covenant God. We are covenant people. He's given us this book here as our book of instructions. And it's not a virtue to say, I don't know anything or believe anything else about the Bible. I'm just going to try to understand this. That's not a virtue to be in a state like that. It's a virtue whenever you say, well, I, I know what the rest of the word says. And God, one thing I know, my doctrine of God, my view of the nature of God is, is God is a simple being. That is, he doesn't contradict himself. He's simple. Most of us are complex. God is not complex. God is simple in the sense that um, he is indivisible. He can't be divided up and scattered and spread out. As Jesus Christ is saying, yesterday, today, and forever, I am the Lord God. I do not. I will not change. So, and God cannot lie. So all these things already add up in your mind that God's going to be consistent with himself in Scripture. So with that example, I would say that that individual behind the name Junia could not be a woman because it would call her an apostle. But here we don't have her called an apostle. Uh, we have a longer phrase, 
she, he, whatever, they are of note among the apostles. So what about the context? Well, the drawback to this approach is that we're waiting on the name, we're waiting on finding out what the name means to help us interpret the other parts of the verse. Well, that's what a whole lot of people are doing anyway. They're waiting on the name to help them interpret the rest of the verse. Now, if it's a woman, then we're going to go down there, and we have a certain belief that women can't be apostles, then once we know what the name refers to, we're going to go down there and say that this phrase, who I've known among the apostles, could not therefore mean that she was an apostle. You're almost waiting on the name before you figure out the rest of the context. So, I don't know if the context is going to be a whole lot of good for us in that sense, but... Uh, I might add as a footnote, later on it may in fact aid us, but maybe not with the phrase or in the way uh, people are thinking. And then one third way that I could think of that we could attempt to get back to the nominative spelling of the name so we have conclusive proof and evidence this is a woman, this is a man, is first century history. Three things, accentuation, the context, first century history. Now here's what I mean by this. Here you would check the records available <coughs> of first century names. You'd look in your lexicons, and especially those that would give the writings from the papyri, uh, which were just the dis uh, disposable documents and pieces of writing and not the great literature that came out of the first few centuries B.C. A.D., you check the records available hoping that one of these names, either Junia or Junius, is non-existent. And so then what would you have on your hands? But by the process of elimination, you'd know what's being, or you would pretty sure know what's being said here in Romans 16, 7. You understand what I mean? You'd check the records. You'd look at birth, we have this available in the papyri. You look at birth certificates and marriage certificates and all this and look over all the names that people named their children, all the Greek names that people named their children during the first century A.D. You know, 2,000 years from now, somebody could look back on our generation. I, I saw a report the other day of, what was it, um, something in New York City, I don't know if it was hospitals or school system, but, but they show the... Um, the, uh, the popularity of certain names over a process of time, like in the 1950s, I, f I forget the examples, but the leading name that parents chose for a girl was such and such. Then they'll show you in 1960, and then in 1970, and 1980, you know, from the birth records or from the school enrollment records, the number one name. And it's funny how you just see names change over a process of time. And like the leading name in 1950 may be number four by 1990. The names just change. Parents just, it's just not in vogue as it was earlier. So you go back to the day in which Paul is writing and check the records. And what you're going to hope now, see if you find there's 18 million juniuses and 18 million junias, well, that's not going to tell you anything about this verse. You're hoping, see this is, this is what a detective would do you think of all the various ways you can go back and get your hands on it you're hoping that one of them is just totally non-existent if you can find one that's just totally non there's never a single recorded instance of this name popping up in the first century then although that's not infallible proof uh, that is rather substantial proof that such could not be the name meant here in Romans 16.7 of course, someone could always argue they never have found yet that document that contains this name. It's still buried in the sands of Palestine or in the sands of Egypt. But forgetting about that, you've got a whole lot of evidence on your side. If you find a whole lot of people named one of these, girls named Junia or boys named Junius, and none, the opposite gender, named the other name, I'd say you've got some fairly good evidence on your hands. <laughs> now, that does it. it's not going to be an infallible type of so you can just totally base your faith on it. Uh, because 2,000 years from now, people check back on the 20th century record and because someone has told them there was somebody named Chino back in those days in America, in Vermont. They'd check, that, you know, they'd check, man, well, they're, they're, not, they're not any people named that. People just weren't named that. You know, you, know, you, can, you can build a whole theory, therefore this person that's named that, he did not exist. He is not... And I'd be a real historical figure in the grave for 2,000 years and somebody telling me that I'm not me. Just because they checked the record and couldn't find, you know, other names. Well, he couldn't be an American. That'd have to be, what, French or is that Spanish 
or Mexican, or it's got to be Oriental, Korean, Chinese, Japanese, you know. So, and I'm just a plain old American. Been an American ever since I was born. <laughs> Both of my parents are, and all of their parents, and their parents' parents, and it, we go back a long time. So, you know, you got kind of somebody throwing you a curve in the historical record, and historians have to watch out for these things. Where did they get that name Chino for someone who's not Oriental or whatever? My wife first met me, and then she'd go home and tell relatives about this boyfriend of hers. Chino, what do you see, Puerto Rican? <laughs> <laughs> You know, where did he come from? They're a little bit worried about who this... They want to look, my eyes, they look funny, or your nose, or your ear. Where are you from? Well, you, you tell them, well, I'm local, I'm from this state here. Yeah, but where are your parents from, though? Where did you come from? I'll never forget that whenever my older sister, and this is back when I was probably 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, something like that, she was... Well, dating with all her boyfriends in high school, and, and uh, you know, they'd ask her questions about her home life and her family, and she would tell them, I have one sister, younger sister, and one brother, younger brother, oh, brother. So they're, they're boys interested in her brother. Well, so what, what, who's that? What's his name? Well, Chino. Well, one of them got so confused on it, he called me Gomez. Gomez. <laughs> all he could think of was I heard a name from her, and it was something like a Mexican name is all I can remember, you know. Chino is like Chico, so Chico has got to be Mexican or Spanish. So whenever I got a dog, that's what I named him, Gomez. I wanted to put the blame on him and take it off of myself. My name's not Gomez. That'd be all right. That'd be all right if you're from Paraguay or Uruguay or Ecuador or Colombia or Bolivia or Mexico. It'd be fine to be named Gomez. <laughs> but I named my lifelong faithful companion dog Gomez. If we ever get a dog with our children, I think we'll probably name that Gomez. Gomez. Well, see, his, all, his own impression of me, all he could think of was, I heard a name, can't remember it, but I know it was Mexican. It somehow was Mexican. No, it's not Mexican. You know it's not a Mexican name, because I'm not a Mexican. <laughs> and I haven't met any Mexicans yet who have that name, Chico or something like that, but not, not Chino. Well, what they had to do is look at the last name, Ross. Ross, Ross, that's a Scottish name. That doesn't sound anything like the Orient or French or Spanish or... That, that has an ancient history among the Scots, among the Scottish people. And my father, anyway, was not born from the south of the Rio Grande. He's a Hoosier. He's from Indiana, Vincennes. Well, that's a French town and a French name, so maybe that name is French after all. Well, it doesn't sound French either. So anyway, you check the records, you do the best that you can, but you could make a mistake. Well, this person could not have existed, although they did because I didn't find a name, or I did, and the name doesn't fit the culture or whatever. So you say, well, what does history tell us then? You look back at first century history. Well, I'll tell you, there was a masculine name, this... Uh, J-U-N-J-U-N-I-A-N-U-S, Junianus. That was a masculine name that's found, that's documented from the first century. It's not very popular or common, but that name has been found, Junianus. So it's possible that Junius, J-U-N-I-A-S, could be a contraction of that, an abbreviated shortened form. But such an example of any alleged abbreviation or contraction of Junianus into Junius has never been discovered. You understand what I'm saying? The name Junius has never been discovered. There are no records of that. If Romans 16.7 is talking about Junius, this is the only historical record that we have of any man named Junius. We do have records of Junianus. And people say, well, maybe Junius is a contraction of that. Maybe so, but we don't have any records. Generally, whenever one parent starts contracting a name, instead of calling someone David, you call him Dave, then all the other parents do as well. And you just got floods of contractions of the same name. We don't have this, though, with Junius. If this is the case, it's the only case that's ever been unearthed or discovered. What about Junia? See, we're looking for, hopefully by process of elimination, the right answer, because one is non-existent. So far, I've told you, one is non-existent, unless Romans 16, 7 is the exception. What about Junia? It was an extremely common girl's name. It was an extremely common girl's name. 
So, let's go back and look at what we are ending up with here thus far. Can't tell anything from the ending on the word. That's the first thing. Can't tell anything from the accusative ending. It could either be masculine or feminine. Can't tell anything by accentuation because it doesn't have accents. Early manuscripts don't have that. Context, well, you couldn't prove something, but I think later I'll, I'll, I'll show you a way in which the context may aid us. Then fourthly, what about first century history? Well, again, this isn't conclusive proof. Maybe we just haven't found those documents that speak of a boy named Junius. But from what we have now, there are no records of a boy named Junius. Boys were not named that during the first century. And what about Junia? An extremely common girl's name. People are still called girls, not a whole lot, but June today. They were called that then. It was an extremely common name. And back to the context for a moment, I said that although the context isn't some type of coffin closing proof for us, I said it may aid us. And in what way would it aid us, telling us that the name is really masculine? No, I can get ahead of the story to tell you that the context may aid us in the direction of what the first century history material is uh, telling us, and that is that this person is a woman, and the right spelling is what you have in the King James, and that is Junia. So where we're ending up right now, so far, this morning, if you've understood all of this evidence on the name, we're just talking about the name, we're ending up with the fact that the odds are it is more likely the accusative eunion, which would make this junia, which would make her a woman. Now, I'm just saying that's where the odds are. The odds are that it's more likely the accusative should be pronounced eunion with the accent on the penult, the next to last syllable. All of the patristic writers, and this is just for purposes of illustration, it doesn't prove anything, except they were closer to the time and they spoke Greek and they had children that were named Greek names, but all of the patristic writers took it as feminine. All those that spoke of this, that commented on this passage in commentaries on the Book of Romans or whatever, in whatever context you'd find it being brought up with the patristic writers, the patristic that means second and third century writers took it as feminine. So what we're going to assume right now is that this was a woman. Now let me just get ahead of the story to say that I believe that it is a woman, but I can't, I can't give evidence that is just absolute final conclusive evidence where you just have to agree or you have to leave the church, one or the other. You're just not welcome if you don't agree with what the Bible teaches. The Bible is not going to teach enough. I mean, the, Paul knew... And he knew whatever he was writing, and they knew, and whoever this person was, they knew. Junia knew whether she was a woman or a man. But because we're removed in this business of accents and all this, and, and Greek endings on words, because of all this business, a little bit of ambiguity has entered into the picture, and, and you can't just prove, but since I, I have a belief, and I, I must believe that I have enough evidence that is leading me in a certain direction, or I would just say, I don't know. Just leave it totally blank. I don't know whether it was a man or a woman. I believe that it was a woman. I don't believe she's an apostle. I don't believe that's what the verse is saying anyway. But I believe she was a woman. I believe that along the lines of several pieces of evidence. One of those, and it's really not the most important one for me, but one of those is this first century evidence here. We haven't found the name Junius among any of the writings. We have found Junia time and time and time again. That would be one procedure for a detective to follow is look and hopefully one is non-existent and then by the process of elimination, you have on your hands the answer, and the answer would be Junia. And because I think there may be something here in the context that would also tell us the answer, and because what I think in the context leads us in the same direction as what we find from first century history, i.e., this is a woman and not a man, then I'm fairly comfortable with my belief. I mean, I'm very comfortable with my belief now that Paul says, Salute Andronicus and Junia. Although the Greek could be Junius, I think it's Junia. So, assuming that this is a woman, 
Then the next question we ask is this, what was her relationship to Andronicus? Assuming that she was a woman, what's her relationship to Andronicus? Well, we've got three choices, I think, here. You could add a fourth, but probably wouldn't make a whole lot of sense. Although, I don't know, it's found in the context, but it is so specified. Anyway, what is her relationship? Well, here's one choice, none. There is no relationship. Well, I think that's ridiculous because they're placed together here by the Apostle Paul. In salutation, they're together. In jail, they're together. Among the apostles, they're together. And in their salvation, they're together. All these are plural. They're my kinsmen. My fellow prisoners are all plural. Who are of note among the apostles? That's plural. Who also were in Christ before me? That's plural. So you say they have no relationship? Then what's this man doing with this woman together? And they're not married. They're not related in some other way. What are they doing together so often in so many things? They go to jail together. They're among the apostles together. They got saved together. And there's no relationship between them at all? Well, I think that's ridiculous. So a second choice Maybe Junia is his sister, the sister of Andronicus. Maybe she could be his sister. Well, that's certainly possible. We have an example of this down in verse 15, where Paul says, uh, salute Nerus and his sister. Or another possibility that sounds more feasible to me, I mean, you could... You could try to make Junia his mother, <laughs> which I don't think would work. Although in the context, verse 13, salute Rufus, chosen the Lord, and his mother in mind. You've got a son and a mother and a brother and a sister. But something else you have in the context is verse 3. That is a husband and a wife. To me, that appears the most natural understanding. And you know what? Let me go back to what I said a moment ago when I said all the patristic writers took it as feminine. The name is feminine. Uh, that's not all I could say about the patristic writers and their view. They not only... Well, that appears the most natural understanding to me. This was probably... hypothesize about them and their state in life, but we do know from Acts 18, uh, Acts 18, 1 to 3, are a married couple. So we also have that type of example right here in our their home or their house. They're together. They're together in several regards here. They are called helpers. Of course, he says greet the church in their home. That's not a fourth thing about them. That's something about their church because these are greet. of salutations here. So on the name, here's where we're going to end up this morning. I'm going to take it as a feminine name according to these several pieces of evidence that I've given you and according to another piece that I haven't given you yet. Now I've got a few moments left, uh, so I don't think I'll get through with this, but let's start into a second matter. We don't necessarily need to draw all this out or we don't need to draw it out unnecessarily discussing Romans 16, 7. 
So with the next few moments, why don't we just begin discussing the next issue in verse 7, and that is this phrase, my kinsman. And what I can't do now, I'll finish later. My kinsman. Now, in Greek, this looks like the following. S-U-N-G-N-E-S. Sungenes. S-U-N-G-E-N-E-S. Sungenes. That's the word in the Greek. My kinsman, my sungenes. It appears 12 times in the New Testament. But what does it mean? Well, you say, well, just what's written. It means my kinsman. Well, all right, my kinsman. But we all know that there are broader and narrower ways of using a term like that. But let's take the Apostle Paul, for an example, and take a look at his relatives or his kinsmen that he had. You can speak of kinsmen in different senses. Let's break this down, and I'll show you various ways in which you could say such and such a person was a kinsman or a relative of Paul. Remember, he's calling them my kinsmen, my relatives. Well, relatives is an ambiguous term, though. Here's how you could break it down for Paul. First of all, through the common father of the human race, Adam, we could say that Paul's relatives included the whole world. Because we all are from the same original pair, Adam and Eve. We all have the same blood. Whether we are Chinese or Mexican or black or white, male, female, Gentile, Jew. We all come from the same original pair. So in that sense, you could talk about your brothers out there in the world. If all you mean by that is we have a common natural head, and that is Adam. Or we can narrow it down a little more for the Apostle Paul, and Paul can mean by relatives, fellow Jews. Why? Because they particularly have a common father, and that is Abraham. Paul's relatives would include the Jews. Or you can narrow it down even more and say, well, what that means is other believers, because they also have a common spiritual source, and that is the Heavenly Father who has given them life and given them birth. Or couldn't it be taken in its uh, most literal and kind of obvious sense, and that is maybe like siblings of the Apostle Paul, brother and sister of his, or in some other way, maybe not sibling, maybe like cousin or aunt or uncle, or in other words, an immediate family member somehow related to the family, not just like all Jews are related through Abraham, or all human beings are related through Adam, or all Christians are related through God the Father, our Heavenly Father, but you can narrow it down even more and be talking just about what we mean when we usually employ the term relatives. Someone uh, that is close to us, an immediate family or an extended family member. So what does it mean here in this passage? Paul calls them my kinsmen. It may, it may help us you see, if we can understand what he means by that, it may help us in interpreting some things about these two people, Andrew Nikus and Junia, and more specifically, Junia, to make sure that she is a woman and not a man. Well, we've got the term uh, sungenes 12 times in the New Testament. In the Gospels and in the book of Acts, the word always has reference to one's brothers and sisters in the same family. That's Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. In, Gos in the Gospels and Acts, Sungenes, we're looking at the way in which the word is used in the New Testament. Always has reference to one's brothers and sisters in the same family, not spiritual brothers, not natural through Adam or through Abraham, but your close family ties. However, in Romans 9, 3, now that's Romans, so we're into this book, book of Romans. In Romans 9, 3, Paul uses the term sungenes, unlike it's used in the Gospels and Acts, to refer to other Jews, not necessarily brothers and sisters. 
Look at uh, Romans chapter 9 and verse 3. He said, I could wish that myself were cursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen. Kinsmen, sungenes. Salute Andrew Nikes and Junior, my kinsmen. Were cursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen. Now, what is Paul talking about in Romans 9, 10, and 11? The Jewish Gentile issue there. And he said, I've got a great heaviness and a continual sorrow in my heart that all these promises that were given through the prophets and through the, the fathers to the nation of Israel and were meant for their good have, it appears, all come to naught for the nation of Israel because although she has a zeal for God, she has a zeal that is not according to knowledge. And, and those who are not Jews outwardly have become Jews inwardly because they have allowed the Gentiles, God, to circumcise their heart as Paul talks about in this same book also in the end of Romans chapter 2. And so Paul is trying to theologically explain, well, what has happened here? Has God, as he'll ask over in chapter 11, just totally cast away his people? Well, he said, God forbid, I also am a Jew. I'm an Israelite. I'm from the nation of Israel. And God didn't cast me away. I'm saved. So he's still dealing with some of them. That's only in a current uh, spiritual church sense. Then Paul goes on to say in Romans 11 and verse 26 that there's going to come a future time where God won't deal with the nation of Israel on an individual basis like he has done from a Pentecost up until now. If you, if you want to be blessed by the Lord and you're a Jew, you've got to know Jesus Christ. You've got to get saved and become a member of the church. You can't just be a, an enlightened Jew and stay out of the church and hope God's going to bless you because he won't do that. Because God's, not, God's dealing with people on a spiritual, individual basis now. But Paul said there's coming a day where the Jewish nation is going to be blessed again by God, and it won't be through the church. Now, it will be by and through Jesus Christ, to be sure. He's going to be the Messiah that comes back, and they're going to see him, and they're going to mourn as one mourns for their only son, Zechariah 12. But they won't have to come through the church to get into the kingdom. In Paul's day, they do. So Paul is trying to deal with this whole matter for people. Well, what has happened to the Jewish nation here? And he said, I've got a continual heavy burden and saw in my heart for the nation of Israel. And that's what he's talking about. So that's what he means by my brethren, my kinsmen. Notice he goes on to say, according to the flesh. And notice in Romans 16, 7, that phrase is not found. My kinsmen, according to the flesh. Whenever you say my kinsmen, according to the flesh, we know what he's talking about, fellow Jews. You might be saved Jews, you might be lost Jews, you're just a kinsman because you both descend from Abraham. And Nero didn't descend from Abraham. So I'm showing you that in the Gospels and the book of Acts, this word syngenes is used one way to refer to what we would think of as relatives, true relatives, brothers and sisters, siblings in the same family. And in Romans 9, 3, however, Paul uses it in another sense, and it's all perfectly... Um, okay and allowed. You have to know from the context here what he's talking about. Here he uses it in a broader sense, not siblings or close relatives of his, but distant ones, the whole Jewish nation. And here he's, of course, talking about the unsaved aspect of the Jewish nation. There are many Jews who have been saved by this time. He's not talking about them. He doesn't have a continual burden and heaviness and sorrow for them because they've already met the Lord, the risen Lord, and seen the truth and the light. He has a sorrow in his heart for those who have it. So when you go back then over to chapter 16 and verse 7, we say, well, let's find the context here. You don't have too much context. It just says, my kinsman. What type of kinsman? Paul is somehow identifying Andronicus and Junia as my kinsman. What does he mean by that? Just that they are fellow Jews or that they are fellow Jews and then some they are relatives of mine, either in my immediate family or in my extended family. Paul could mean one or the other of those. Just Jews are Jews and then some immediate family members. Because if you're a family member, relative of Paul in that sense, of Paul's in that sense, obviously you would have to be a Jew. So to say the latter is to include the former. But to, could, but to start with the former, that they are Jews, doesn't necessarily include the latter, that they are relatives of the Apostle Paul. So you've got two different views. Looks like we're going to be out of time, and I'll pick up with this next time. Two different views. Is Paul speaking of relatives of his? We'll give you some arguments for and against this. 
Or is Paul just speaking of them as Jews, their kinsmen, because they descend from Abraham? Two different views here. Or can we even be certain about the matter, since we don't really have much as far as context is concerned? I might add that if Paul meant simply that these are Jewish people, it would have been nice if he would have said, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. Then we say, oh, that's Romans 9.3. That's easy to interpret. He doesn't mean that this is a brother or sister, aunt or uncle or cousin or nephew or niece of his. He just means that they're Jews, the Jews that are Christians now, Jewish Christians now. But he doesn't say my kinsmen according to flesh. He just said my kinsmen. He had other things to say and he went on. Obviously, they knew, he knew, and everybody else knew in what relation those people stood to the Apostle Paul. We're looking back 2,000 years later, looking back through a dark window trying to figure it all out. So we'll start working on that next time. And hopefully we'll go through that rather quickly and get into uh, the important matters, and those are the uh, final two things that he says about them, who are of note among the apostles and who were also in Christ before me. Those are very important.